Welcome to the Nurtured Nerds Epic Podcast. Come join us and get cuddly, get gaming, get nerdy. And get and nurtured. Get Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, just a brief uh, introduction of myself and the other hosts. I'm Jo. I'm in Perth, Western Australia, and I'm a professional cuddler. Wonderful. Thank you, Jo. I'm Crystal. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, definitely happy to, to be a part of this Nurtured Nerds community, and I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I'm a, also a professional cuddler. <laughs> and what will we be talking about today, Joe? <laughs> so on today's episode, we are nerding out on dreaming, lucid dreams, and dream worlds. Joining us for this discussion are lucid dreamer and author Robert Waguna, I hope I've spelled that correct, uh, pronounced that correctly, and soul coach and professional cuddler Susan Lee and former museum and rehabilitation worker, now aspiring lucid dreamer, Bethany. We will also talk about some more nerdy things, cuddly things, and let you know what's going on in our community right now, at the end. And we still have a raffle for our new members to get a chance to win a care package. So come join us and find out more about our nerdy self-care community. Thank so, you. No, yeah, thank you so much, Joe. <laughs> so I, I know we're, we're going to ask some really wonderful questions. We usually start off talking a little bit about things that we like to um, sip on during, during the podcast. So if anyone would like to share a delicious beverage that they're, they're drinking, I haven't started mine yet, but it is literally a nitro coffee so that I can stay awake and rock out with you guys. <laughs> so if anyone wants to share a tea or delicious beverage, please share. Well, I'm I may. Got, oops. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> no, go I, made iced, I made iced uh, peppermint tea last night put it in the fridge and now it's nice and cold because it's hot here because it's summer that sounds delicious thank you for sharing and thank you Bethany what were you drinking cold clear water <laughs> and my favorite <laughs> cow cup the best <laughs> the best agua all day would anyone else like to to share um i'm having the same agua and just a bottle because <laughs> i'm traveling so on the run Warm water <laughs> nice nice and of course that pretty much is you know how we start off our podcast we also like to ask for introductions um of course i'd love to hear just a little bit about yourself where you're from um just you know what kind of work you do what kind of um, connection you have to dreaming or what interest you have in it. And again, it can be as brief as you'd like. And, and we'll start with Robert, if you're comfortable starting. And thank you again for being here. Hi, everyone. I'm Robert Wagoner. I'm the author of two books on lucid dreaming. Uh, the first is Lucid Dreaming, Gateway to the Inner Self. It's been reprinted about 15 times and translated into a number of languages. And also I'm the co-author of Lucid Dreaming, Plain and Simple, with uh, my co-author, Carolyn McCready. And that's the book that has all the tips and techniques on how to become lucid, stay lucid, and use it to access creativity or to promote health and all those great wild things that you can do in lucid dreams. That's amazing. That is very, very fascinating work. And, and I think we're all very excited to have you here. So thank you for sharing that. Mm. Yes, good to meet you, Robert. Really excited to... Yeah, what you have to say and share. And Susan, would you like to go next? Sure, I'd love to go next. Um, my name is Susan Lee. Some people know me in community as Sus. I'm a soul coach, event leader, professional cuddler, um, based out of Santa Monica, California. And um, I'm also working on some new programs that I'm excited about too, related to the different dimensions of relating and um, different flavors of intimacy. So look forward to, to sharing that and how you can hear more about that going forward. And um, what else do I wanna say? I just, I'm excited about all things related to um, consciousness, personal growth, 
exploring uh, connection and relating in all different ways. So that's what brings me here. So thank you for being here, Susan. So good to see you. We're glad to have you. And Bethany, would you like to share? Um, sure, I don't have as much to share as everybody else, but um, Bethany L. Terry, I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And um, I'm really, really excited to be learning more about lucid dreaming. And um, I have kind of studied a little bit in the past and um, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm really excited to be learning more. <laughs> Well, we're excited to learn with you. Well, you're in the right place. <laughs> you're in the right place. Okay. And a quick question for everybody. I like this question. What kind of dreamer are you? Are you casual, frequent, vivid, or lucid? But do any of those words resonate with you? And uh, just feel, share, feel free to... I'm, I'm definitely just a casual dreamer. Awesome. So, uh, I, I'm a consistent dreamer and uh, also a lucid dreamer. And so uh, it's something that's I've really focused on the last uh, few decades. Fantastic. Beautiful. Um, and for me, it depends. Depends what's going on in my life. I have had lucid dreams. So I, I have had those experiences. I've had times where I haven't been able to quite capture what's going on in my dream world. And, um, and I've had repetitive dreams. So I've, I've had a lot of different experiences in the dream world, and I'm still excited to explore more. So this is an Ooh. exciting topic. So, yes, very rich topic. And Joe, how about you? What kind of dreamer are you? Oh, <laughs> well, funny you should ask. I knew that I was going to be doing this co-host podcast this morning because it's morning for me. And guess what happened last night? I was absolutely lucid dreaming for ages. And that hasn't happened for what? I've had many lucid dreams, but not recently. But of course, last night, boom, it was amazing. I was literally in control of everything I could do anything I wanted I swam under the water with my clothes on I could I could um sorry someone's on my phone I could um fly I could do anything so it was amazing so yeah and what about you Krista what kind of dreamer are you it's so funny um that you mentioned that because I I had a very unique dream last night and I I honestly have been thinking about dreams. And um, although I wouldn't say this was a full on lucid, I, I feel like there were still some interesting fears and different things coming up, but I have what I like to call epic adventurous dreams where I try to dive back into them. I will literally try to fall back asleep, stay asleep longer. Um, I used to have some really interesting theories. A lot of my dreams do surround fears that I carry. So uh, my beautiful children were in my dreams, kind of adventuring, chasing them. A lot of really amazing stuff happened this morning. And I thought of us, I thought of like, podcast and got very excited to share. So thank you for asking. And that really does uh, resonate well and segue into to what our next question is. Um, it, it very much, uh, you know, I, I, I very much pondered, excuse me, the purpose of dreams and what, what I'm doing. Am I working through things? Am I, you know, facing old uh, habits or facing old uh, phenomenon or things that have happened in my life? You know, what kind of goals can I achieve within dreams? What can we do? And so the question really is, you know, can Everybody tell us a little bit about what you believe dreams are and what you believe their purpose is, whether that's biological, evolutionarily, uh, psychological, or even spiritual. And I do have so many beautiful thoughts on this myself, but I would love to hear what you have to say. Is anyone called to share first? And no pressure, no rush. I'll just start out. Um... Uh, I'll tell you, I, I've been paying attention to dreams for my entire life. What I think, and this is my own personal theory, is that there's various levels of the self. And in dreams, we communicate amongst these various levels of the self. 
and also we exchange information and energy. And so this allows the whole self to know what's going on and each portion of the self to benefit from the other portions of the self. So that's what I think the purpose of dreaming is. And that's why all of us dream, mammals dream, um, just life dreams. So that's that's what I think is going on. That's fascinating. And I'm, I'm really interested um, by the, the, the idea that we're facing different parts of ourself, different aspects of ourself. Uh, something I think about and meditate on a lot is um, the idea of the tarot deck and that and how we all are different characters or actors within that that major arcana. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the tarot deck. I absolutely adore it, but it's it's fascinating that you mentioned different personalities. I feel like we all have a very wide cast of, of characters that help us get through this life, different personalities. You could call them anything, um, but I love that. So thank you for sharing that, Robert. That was really beautiful. So yeah, I'll go. Um, gosh, I've done so many things in my dream world that I, I don't know what my current theory is. That's why I'm excited to explore this topic tonight. Um, because at times in my lucid dreaming, I've decided to do certain things such as flying or have certain experiences. But sometimes it's been more of a protective mechanism. Like I'm out of here. I know I'm dreaming like I'm out. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of things I find myself working on that seem related to my real life, but sometimes I also feel like I'm communicating with others that there's like something going on, whether it's somebody that's no longer here on this planet, on this earth, but sometimes it's with other people that are, and they might be just communicating to me or I to them. So I just, I feel like, yes, it's, it's all me and different aspects of me. And I, I have different symbolism that means uh, things to me, you know, because I've had a recurring. Um, and I've had some new experiences that I've gone beyond what I thought was just me, where other people are truly coming in and are, um, I, I must at least be open energetically to them because otherwise I don't think I would allow them into my my dream world and my consciousness, but it's like they're communicating that way because they can't do it in the physical. So I think that's beautiful. No, yeah. thank you so much for sharing. I, I really uh, enjoyed that, and I, I very much feel communicated with a lot of times in my dreams. Um, you know, whether that's from myself, my higher self, or other uh, beautiful, amazing beings. One thing you touched on that I really enjoyed was just talking about symbols or how symbolism can kind of connect to us in our dreams. I think that instinctually as humans, we've passed down so many amazing symbols uh, throughout like culture, religion, our own, you know, societal growth and evolution into what a society is. And it's, it's amazing how many symbols are passed down through different um, uh, groups, but yet they all kind of connect in and how they can be reused for a different purpose. So I kind of love that. And I feel like that, that resonates with me in dreams as well. So thank you, Susan. And Bethany, would you like to share? Sure. Um, I, I, I really agree with what all three of you have said. Um, I think dreams, there's just so many different levels, um, so many different things that can happen and, and different purposes too. I've, I too have had like communications and dreams with living and dead people. And um, it, there's prophetic dreams. There's um, just the like mental housekeeping dreams. And, and also healing dreams where you're working out things that you need to work out. Um, I, I think it's, it's a really so, so wide, so vast that it's hard to define what it, what it all is. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Bethany. Thanks for sharing. Uh, my next question is about how does, how do you think or do you believe lucid dreaming compares to playing video games or other simulated experiences? And if you, if it does compare, kind of what ways is that similar? So anybody like to share about that? Well, um, I, I think um, lucid dreaming and virtual realities, um, they do, at least on the surface, share some commonalities. Um, the, the one thing though that I, when I talk to gamers, I say, 
Now, it, when you're deep into a game, you know that someone coded it. You know that there are some limits to the programming. But in a lucid dream, who programs the lucid dream? Ooh. When you go around a corner uh, on a lucid dream street, and now you see a magical castle and a, and a unicorn, who created that? Who brought that into being? When you fly through a wall into a new dimension, who created that? Who brought that into being? So, mm -hmm. so that's kind of the difference. In a virtual reality game, you know there's limits to the programming, but I think in lucid dreaming, you realize if you're a good lucid dreamer that it's truly something much deeper and more creative that you're engaging with, uh, which I would say is your unconscious mind or your larger self. And because of that, it's infinitely more fascinating. Mm, spot on. Wow, that just gave me like, seriously, that just gave me goosebumps. I just love that. Love that. Anybody else like to share? Um, yeah, I really appreciate what you shared, Robert, because I hadn't really quite thought about it that way. But yeah, it actually is. It's programmed back in one of my many lives that I've already had on this planet. I was a, a computer science was my degree and I programmed back in the day a long time ago. Um, but there are there are limits. There are things that you you plan for as much as you can, but there's going to be some something that you didn't plan for and it's there's going to be a stop on that or you're going to get stuck in some loop of something and um so yeah to lucid dream it does it feels limitless and um that to me is even more exciting even though gaming also is is really expanding and there's a lot of things that we can do now that was not possible before so um if those worlds can somehow be commingled that that would be really exciting absolutely thank you, thank you Susan. anybody else have any comparisons or similarities well the only thing i really have to say about that is i think about the games and how you have to keep repeating levels over and over and over again until you finally get to the the goal and that kind of resonated with me with um, the dreaming also you kind of have have to repeat things until you get them right <laughs> yeah I really I like that. About that. yeah that ties into repetitive dreaming doesn't it awesome Thank yeah, you. I hadn't really thought about that, Bethany. I, I really appreciate that because um, we are always kind of leveling up like you do in a game world. I feel like that's that's part of what we're always doing in our real life here, too. So, um, yeah, we will have to repeat things, but it's not quite the same as as before, even though it looks, tastes, smells, seems like I've been here before, done this, but there's something different about this level. And also for the people who might be listening who have recurring dreams or recurring nightmares, I, this is what I've learned and it has to do with what Bethany is talking about. Oftentimes on a computer form, if you don't type in a certain novel or proper response on one of the uh, input areas, it'll always bounce you back to the beginning and you'll keep getting bounced back until you finally fill out that one uh, blank that, that you're doing incorrectly. And so sometimes I think that's the same thing with recurring nightmares and recurring uh, dreams, that the dream is asking you for a new creative response. Because normally our response is either fight or flight. That's just uh, the reptilian brain uh, going on. But when you come up with a new response, then all of a sudden, you'll see that that recurring dream or nightmare basically comes to an end. And, and I recognized this when I was uh, probably 10 or 11. I had a recurring uh, dream that the invisible man was in the house. And, and the first time I had this uh, recurring dream, you know, it's kind of cool. Oh, the invisible man's in the house. Isn't that cool? But as it went on, I started to think, well, what if the invisible man is going to hurt us? And so I'd go find all the knives in the kitchen and hide them and all that kind of stuff. 
And then one time um, I could tell the invisible man was in a certain room. And so I ran and got a bucket of paint and put it above the door so that when the invisible man came out of the door, the bucket of paint would fall on the invisible man. Now he'd be visible and the whole uh, gig would be up. And after that, never had that recurring dream again. So I think that that's what's happening with recurring dreams is asking for a creative response to the situation. And when you give it, you've satisfied it and you move on to the next level. Mm. Mm. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I love that. Love that. I will remember that next time I'm in my recurring dream of packing. I always have recurring dreams of packing and going somewhere and then realizing I haven't packed everything. Can I start freaking out? So, hey, <laughs> I remember that one. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you so much for sharing, Robert. And and I think I think we can all relate to the idea of of the repetitiveness of um, video games and the in the idea of um, you know dying and starting again. I I remember playing a game very much. You died. You had to start way back at the beginning. Um, and I think that's such a good example of like that that small linear. Even the Super Mario's that small linear. Hey just go back and, and try something different. So I really love those perspectives. Um, let me ask, because uh, we didn't touch on it yet, but for people who maybe don't know, how would everyone here define lucid dreaming? And I know what I think of it as, which is um, being in control or being aware of the dream. However, I still worry that I don't actually know the, the actual definition of the, the real understanding of what people would consider lucid dreaming. So I'm, I'm asking Robert first. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you've oh. got this answer. So, uh, so, so for, for most of us, we would say a lucid dream is any dream in which you realize within the dream that you're dreaming. You literally know, hey, this is a dream. And so it might be that you see Uncle Bill and you think, wait a second, Uncle Bill died three years ago. How can this be? Oh, this must be a dream. So you know you're dreaming. Now, I uh, don't use the word control when it comes okay. to lucid dreaming. Because what I think is that you're actually relating uh, to your larger self, your larger awareness. And so when I go around the corner and discover a new setting, I did not control that into being. It just occurred, um, you might say on an automatic level or an unconscious level. So, so in a lucid dream, I can direct myself and influence myself uh, just like I can in the waking world but mm. I don't control everything because mm. I'm oftentimes stunned and surprised by all the unexpected creativity I encounter. But mm. lucid dreaming is realizing within a dream that you're dreaming. Yeah. I'm fascinated by that. And I think, I think that's a really good point to make. I think language really contributes, if you can still hear me, <laughs> my uh, connection may be a little unstable. Um, but I, I was stating um, that that element of uh, letting go of control or not using that word, I think really, really resonates strongly with me. Um, so thank you for sharing that. I, that really was important. But because I, I do want to point out that uh, in a lucid dream, uh, some of the most profound lucid dreams that people have are the ones in which they surrender. They, they mm -hmm. just announce in the lucid dream, I now yeah. surrender to my higher awareness or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then they go on sometimes and have the most incredibly profound uh, lucid dreams. So I'm going to write that down. <laughs> so so, so, so I, I know people use the word control and, and I kind of understand they're trying to say they influence and manipulate and direct themselves within the lucid dream, but control is really too big a word. Yeah, and that's a very Buddhist concept. Right. I'm, I'm very fascinated by that. Yeah. And you were going to yeah. say Susan. Oh, I was just going to say, I love that you said surrender because to me, that's just guidance in general. I don't care what consciousness level you're at. When we surrender, that's when the magic happens. That's when the flow happens. Mm. And we're still able to respond, you know, accordingly. It's not like we're totally not managing, um, but it's just, it's just a matter of we're allowing the, the possibilities, allowing the unexpected and still knowing, oh, I'm here. I got this. I'm aware. I'm, I have all my faculties. It's just, I'm in a different dimension now. That's all it happens to be the dream dimension. 
Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I love that word, aware. We're aware. We're aware that we're dreaming. Simple as that. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody, for sharing. All right, let's talk about emotional and sensual intensity of dreams. Uh, does anyone experience romantic dreams, cuddly dreams, thrilling dreams, sad dreams, dying in dreams, things like that? And do you sometimes feel that those feelings and sensations in the dreams carry over into the waking? world well uh, when you look at the science um, some of our most intense uh, neurological events and also our most intense hormonal events occur in the dream state and so that's why sometimes uh, after a dream you might wake up on the right side of the bed or you might wake up on the wrong side of the bed because you've probably had a very intense uh, hormonal or neuro endocrinal uh, transmission. But um, in some ways, I think that's kind of this information flow that's being sent throughout the system and that just naturally occurs in dreams, I think, to uh, basically to prepare us. But it's interesting. Uh, one of the beautiful things in a lucid dream, because you can, in a sense, direct it, is uh, you can begin to compare and contrast uh, the senses so in a lucid dream, I can walk into that lucid dream kitchen, open up the lucid dream refrigerator and see if that lucid dream banana tastes like a real banana should. And, and so you can do all these comparisons, you know, whether it's drinks or food or, or uh, physical actions and physical intimacy and all that kind of stuff. You can, you can do that uh, kind of thing in a lucid dream and compare and contrast it. It was interesting that Stephen LaBerge, who's one of the um, kind of grandfather of uh, lucid dream research, um, he did a lot of research and then he decided that he was going to do a research study on um, becoming lucidly aware and finding a partner to have um, uh, physical relations with. I'll, I'll just PG-13 it. And, uh, so he's, he got the uh, lucid dreamers into the sleep lab. He put 17 physiological measures on their bodies. And he told them, when you become lucidly aware, signal with your eyes that you're lucidly aware, then signal when you found a partner, and then signal when you're going to uh, start to have physical relations. And, and he said that lucid dream sex was almost the equivalent of physical sex on 15 of the 17 measures. It was only the, the breathing rate and the heart rate did not get quite as intense, but all the other measures were just lining up perfectly with the physical, physical act. And so that, I think that what that shows is uh, kind of what, what we're talking about in terms of virtual reality is that in the virtual reality of lucid dreams, um, you know, that kind of physical realm can be as intense and sometimes I'd say even more intense than what you can experience in the physical uh, reality. Yeah, I mean, I don't know it from a scientific basis, so that's fascinating to know that that was tried. I just know from my own personal experience, because I have had that and it felt very real to me. I'm like, whoa, like, you, you know, you just wake up with that kind of visceral experience, like, whoa, did that just happen? Was that real? Because it to me, that's how it really felt. It felt really intense. And um, sometimes I've come out of dreams and went, okay, wait a minute, did that happen or what? <laughs> so yeah, that's fascinating to know that it's actually been measured and, and done that way. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I really do love hearing about um measuring that I think that's really interesting I only have um to share about romantic dreams um one I had at a party where I fell asleep and had that dream and then woke up having talked in my sleep and had a real life audience afterward <laughs> so that's that's what I have to say about romantic dreams <laughs> Thank you, Bethany. Yeah, I think that um, my experience uh, has been that, that yes, uh, very much what you said, Robert, in that you wake up feeling 
like I feel like it, like the dreams, and again, I'll keep it as, as PG rated as possible, but any of the dreams where intimacy, sexual intimacy was happening, um, the, the, the very much physical feeling was still there waking up. And that actually included emotional dreams as well, meaning when fear or, or being frightened or being afraid, um, I've, I've had dreams of fighting off zombies. And, and like, it's interesting how much I can wake up and, and still have the same emotion flowing through me, that, that physical feeling is there, that body feeling, which I think is pretty magical and pretty interesting um, that they connect so well, the mind and the body. Um, Moving on to our, our next question, I'm of course very fascinated by the way dreams are depicted um, through others. You know, I feel like art is very much a beautiful, perceptive um, and surreal opportunity for people to say, you know, what's in their mind or their heart. And so as we all perceive art in different ways, um, you know, I love the idea that people portray in movies, in art, dreams. And so um, some of the movies that are coming to mind that we discussed are Inception, The Matrix, um, Nightmare on Elm Street. You know, they kind of talk a little bit about fears, a little bit about nightmares. Uh, Donnie Darko is actually one of my favorite movies. Do you, how do you feel about their portrayal of dreams, number one? And do you feel that dreams within dreams are possible? I know that's kind of a double, that's a lot of info going on, but really just what do you feel about that um, and about those depictions of dreams. So in a fair number of the um, movies, they, they do a pretty good job of in entertaining the idea of lucid dreaming, becoming consciously aware within the dream state. Um, I, I, I do have to point out something about in Inception that a, a friend of mine brought up, which is I, I've had more than a thousand lucid dreams and, uh, and my friend has had many of hundreds, if not more than a thousand. And he, he mentioned something, he said, you know, I've never had a lucid dream where I've been in a car chase or a gunfight because I know it would be imaginary. I mean, there'd be lucid dream guns and lucid dream bullets and lucid dream car chases. I, I, he goes, that, that has just never occurred to me. But of course, in Hollywood, to make things dramatic and dull, you, you have to uh, bring in that kind of, you know, chase and violence and all that kind of stuff. But um, but they do get across the basic idea of becoming consciously aware. And they do ask some good questions like Inception did. If you became consciously aware inside the dream state, could you access somebody else's uh, information and, and, and wake up and, and retrieve it? And, and so, so those are all good questions to ask and uh, fun things to play around with. Um, but yeah. I, f I feel like uh, Hollywood is still waiting for a really brilliant lucid dream movie. We, we just haven't got it yet. We've had, we've had some interesting ones, but a really brilliant one hasn't arrived yet. I like that. Thank you. I feel like cinematically, there's some interesting movies, uh, What Dreams May Come calls to mind. And there was a new one that was about psychedelics uh, called The Wave. And I was fascinated by how well they cinematically portrayed um, either a dream state or a, a you know, a psychedelic visionary state. And so I, I feel like they're getting like, they're, they're getting closer. <laughs> so I really liked what you said about that, Robert. Thank you. And, and of course, um, a lot of people would say lucid dreaming is comparable to taking the red pill in the matrix. I don't know if you would agree with that, but it, it seems, seems viable. I like it. And then of course, does anyone else want to share? I am very fascinated by the subject. Um, I, I don't really have the science behind it to really say much, so I kind of defer more to Robert and others that have had more experience with it, but um, I enjoy it entertainment-wise, and I look forward to the continued exploration of how we can portray things in, in a way, whether it be a virtual reality, a, a movie, you know, these kinds of experiences where we can have that visceral, because there, I mean, you can think about um, experiences you've had, like I was at Disneyland recently, and they have you flying, you know, you're sitting in a simulation, and like you're flying, you feel that, you feel like you're going, you know, up and down and all around, you know, the world, and that's what they have you doing, and I love experiences like that, so if, if we can get to a point where that's how we experience a, a movie, let's say, you know, where we're truly 
moving with it. I know they've kind of played around with things and they're working on that, but that to me, like, like imagine like Avatar, which I'm excited for that next uh, Avatar 2 coming out. But I, you know, imagine if we could be in that kind of experience, smell the smells, you know, feel the wind, you know, feel the movement and all of that. That to me would be epic. I would love it. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. I can definitely resonate with that. There's a lot of really beautiful things at the theme parks like Disney that really do give you that all around feeling, that all around, you know, immersion, if you will, which I think is fascinating. And I think that, yes, you're right. Cinematically, it's hard to, it's hard to match that, I think, but I love it. Mm. I think for me, uh, movies really influence, majorly influence my dream world. Um, I, I had dreams within dreams before I saw Inception, but after I saw Inception, they increased. And um, definitely, definitely movies like any spy movie. Oh my God, I've had so many dreams and lucid dreams that I'm a spy or other big realizing other people are a spy. Yeah, I definitely believe that. Even I can watch a trailer for a movie and then I will dream about it. So I'm very, 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 I have to be careful. What, so I'm now more um, discerning of what I watch because I know that that will be in my dream world, especially ch being chased. I had a lot of being chased mo uh, film, um, mo dreams because I had watched a lot of chase movies, but now I've stopped being chased and I turn around and I face the thing that is chasing me because in real life, I'm now being with my fears. So in my dreams, I'm being, I'm looking at whatever it is that's chasing me, whether it's a monster or a dark shadow, I'm looking at it instead of keep running away. It's, it's, it's amazing. And I'm curious if anybody else has had, is an ad lib question. <laughs> if anybody else has had experiences like that to do with fears. Um, so has anybody, have fears in real life that have been played out in their dream world or has their dream world helped them be with fears in the real world, real world, waking world, anybody? Well, uh, I'll tell a uh, lucid dream that helped me quite a bit. And uh, so, so a lot of times when, when we're being chased, uh, the, Carl Jung would call these uh, dreams of the shadow. And so there, the shadow, he considered the denied, ignored, repressed parts of the self that oftentimes took the shadow position behind us. And that's why we won't face him. And that's why we won't look at him. We just run and, and try to get away from him because we're in such denial. And, and so um, one time I found myself in a farmhouse in the South and, and the farm wife put beans on my plate. And I looked around, I thought, wait a second, I don't live in the South. I don't live on a farm. How can this be? And I thought, oh, this is a dream. I'm dreaming this. And right at that moment, I realized that there was this energy behind me. And so after decades of lucid dreaming, I always go to the area of the most energy when I become lucidly aware. Because in my mind, uh, my larger awareness has uh, helped create the beginning of the lucid dream, particularly and so if there's energy there, it's something that I should focus on. So I turn around and it's a lovely young black woman. She's smiling at me. I pick her up and I put her right in front of me. And so I ask her a question because I want to find out what she represents. So I just ask her, who are you? Who are you? And then she replies, I am a discarded aspect of yourself. And I think what do you do with a discarded aspect of yourself? And then I think, oh, if she's been discarded, she wants to be accepted. And so from my heart, I begin to accept her. And, and so this is when you realize that the dream figures oftentimes are projections of your own thoughts, because as I accept her, she gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And then I decided just to just totally accept her. And she became colored light pieces of colored light that came into my torso and, and it was really so powerful that I woke up in bed at that moment and, and so when I woke up I knew energetically I was different uh, I just knew that 
boy, I, I changed. Something happened in that lucid dream, reintegrating with that energy that I'm just different now. And then it was a week later, I realized every day since that dream, I'd been thinking I should try to write that book on lucid dreaming, the project I discarded a year ago because it was too hard. And then I thought, oh, discarded. That woman represented all the energy I'd put into that first book and then I gave up on. And now she was telling me I was ready to uh, reintegrate that energy and I was able to write my first book. So, so again, um, you know, that, that's the beautiful thing. If you are being chased in a dream and can think, wait a second, this has happened before. Oh, I'm dreaming this and turn around and see what's chasing you. But then if you can go one step further and say, who are you or what do you mm. represent? Because yeah. people who have read my books tell me all the time, oh, I did that. And I learned that, oh, I'm being chased by my fear of boredom. And I can't believe it. I'm bored all the time. And I, I have this fear of, you know, being bored. And I was like, oh, my gosh. But I mean, this will take care of, you know, years of psychotherapy and stuff. When you just ask, what do you represent? Who are you? And, and when the dream figure tells you, it's like, oh, I get it. But normally, the best way to respond is to give it what it lacks. So if it's full of hate, send it love. If it's a needy child, send it whatever it needs and do that. And then you can reintegrate that energy and, and in that way become more of your whole self. Mm, that's beautiful. Perfect. Because you've answered another question that we don't have to ask now. That was amazing. <laughs> yeah, something that really struck me while you were talking, Robert, was that there's a, an interesting practice um, in Buddhism. And there's a whole book on it. It's called Feeding Your Demons. And it talks a lot about that idea of, of focusing on an energy that maybe you, a shadow or a portion of you that you haven't really focused on before, maybe something you don't like. Uh, and it's, it's interesting because it's just literally a visual technique of, of focusing on that energy, asking what it wants, asking what it would feel if it got what it wanted, and then literally like feeding it your nectar, your body, your, your soul, your heart, accepting it, loving it, and then turning it into an ally or, or turning it into, it diminishes as a, as a demon or as a, a negative. So that was, as you spoke, I was just like, wow, blown away that you're literally taking lucid dreaming and using it as a therapy session and able to work through so much. So thank you so much for sharing. That was beautiful. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, I loved hearing about that dream. That, that really was amazing. Yeah, and, and just the whole aspect um, of that we can heal. This is just an, another level of healing, whether it's psychologically healing, but I also think physically as well there's another opportunity there because that's really what what we're doing when we're sleeping we're regenerating ourselves you know and so what if we were more mindful about that and planted that seed as we're going into dream world like okay i would really like to you know fix these particular cells or this kink in my neck or you know whatever might be diseased in your body whatever might be out of whack so emotionally physically I, I just think it's a whole realm that needs to be explored even more um consciously and and have a chance to to use that so I love what you shared Robert because I that makes some sense for some dreams that I've had and what what their purpose was you know, it's interesting. After my um, first book came out, it, it was a few years later, I, I got an uh, email from a young guy. And, and he told me he wanted to write me after he got his associate's degree at a community college in California. And, and he said the reason he wanted to wait is that he knew that would take two years. And then that would mean that he had been off of drugs for two years. And, and so he wrote me uh, when he graduated. And he said, what happened was, that he was in rehab uh, for the second time in his teenage life. He'd got hooked on meth and, and was just making a total mess of his life. But he's in rehab the second time because the first time didn't do anything. And he was bored out of his mind and, and saw on his counselor's uh, uh, desk um, the, the copy of my first book. And so he asked to read it because he'd had some lucid dreams before and, and knew what it was all about. And, and so in my book, uh, I, I share how 
I came to realize uh, as I got into lucid dreaming that you could interact with this non-visible awareness. You know, you could call it your unconscious mind. You can literally stop in a lucid dream and say, hey, dream, show me something important for me to see. And then sometimes the entire lucid dream will change or just some little thing will appear. Anyway, this guy, he began to have lucid dreams, began to interact with what I call the awareness behind the dream. And one time, the awareness behind the dream asked him a question and said, do you want to see what your life will be like if you continue to use drugs? And this young guy said, sure, sure, show me. And then he said it was like a 10-minute film of all the people he would hurt, all the damage he'd do to his body, all the mess he would just make of things, and, and just all the unhappiness that, that would exist. Because, And he said, because of that one lucid dream, that's when he decided that he had to get clean. And, and he said, all the counseling and all that, you know, you could always lie to the counselor, you could always lie to yourself. But he said, when his larger awareness showed him what was going to be the outcome of it all, he said that's when he realized he had to give it up. And, and so that, that's one thing, uh, you know, that's why I call my first book, Lucid Dreaming Gateway to the Inner Self. I, I'm literally talking about engaging with your larger awareness. And, and so that's, that's when you really get into some of the powerful aspects of it. Because it's nice to interact with a dream figure and find out what it represents and why it's chasing you and all. But boy, sometimes when you interact with your larger awareness, that's when your mind is just uh, uh, kind of changed and transformed. Thank mm. you so much for sharing that. Mm. Nice. In a powerful, powerful transformation. Yeah. And I, I didn't really think about it, but now this kind of relates to part of the work that I'm drawn into and why I call myself a soul coach. Yes, I'm a life coach by training and it's evolved into soul coaching because through my own inner work, that's what it kept boiling down to. I can do all the different programs and trainings and retreats and read all the books I've done. it. <laughs> and the bottom line is it's, it's my relationship, that sacred relationship that I have with me, my inner awareness, my soul, I call it soul, but it's, it's the same sort of thing. And we keep looking out there somewhere in this person or this guru or that, nope, it's in here. And lucid dreaming, I didn't really totally make that correlation until now, but that's one of the ways, there are many strategies to access that and work with that. And um, that, I, I love hearing that that helps somebody with an addiction because that is really exciting because that's hard that's really hard inner work to do and um so that's amazing mm. Mm. thank you yeah i have a question before i get going about um do you believe or have any reflections on whether dreams are glimpses into past lives or parallel universes sounds fun and exciting but i don't know again how will we ever know anybody have any thoughts on that well uh, um i, I uh, co-edit this online magazine uh, it's a free online magazine called the lucid dreaming experience uh, and my co-editor is lucy gillis up in canada and oftentimes in her lucid dreams uh she meets parallel Lucy's or what you might call probable Lucy's. And sometimes they'll sit in the lucid dream and compare notes. And it's the most hilarious thing uh, to, to, to hear her lucid dreams because she's really into this idea of probable selves or parallel realities that, you know, it's all branching out from this moment point and, and that kind of thing. Um, in my own particular experience, I, I have to say that, you know, when I was a young guy growing up in the Midwest, um, I just had the kind of typical view, the, you know, the typical kind of uh, worldview that, oh, you have this one life, and then at the end of it, you, you either go to heaven or hell, or you end up in, a, you know, nowhere, and, and, and that's just it. But my dreams started to show me these other uh, lives. Like, like the first time I ever drank wine uh, was probably when I was 11 years old, looking through the eyes of a guy 
who was wearing this heavy wool coat, and I'm pretty sure he was in Rotterdam in the Netherlands around 1900, and I knew the docks were right behind him in this apartment, and he had this glass of red wine in his, ha in his hand, and I was looking through his eyes, basically seeing his apartment, and he brought the wine up to his lips and, and drank it, and it, he had the kind of wine that burst in your mouth. I mean, it's that great. And when I was a little kid, I woke up and I thought, wow, wine's that good? This is incredible. And, you know, because I grew up in a family that, you know, my parents never had any alcohol in the house. It, it just, just wasn't allowed. And, uh, but, but I have had a number of these kind of dreams that made me realize that this kind of one life view is just totally erroneous, that uh, all of us, uh, uh, if, we, if we knew the truth of it, would be surprised at the number of, of lives we've had. I, I'm talking literally into the hundreds. And uh, so, so anyway, uh, I do think in the dream world, sometimes we look through the eyes of others uh, who, who we're connected to in that sort of sense. But, and on occasion, you can get information that you can verify when you wake up. Uh, for example, one time I was looking through the eyes of this one guy and he's reading this uh, silver tablet and the tablet's made out of metal. And there's, there's like three pages to it and he flips it. And he's reading this really weird language. And, and so I ask, I, I ask, what is this? What, what's he reading? And a voice behind me says the Heart Sutra. And so the Heart Sutra is one of the books in Buddhism. It's, it's actually one of the shorter uh, sutras. And in there is the famous term of uh, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. So, so anyway, uh, I woke up and I thought, okay, you know, was that Sanskrit? So I Googled Sanskrit. No, it wasn't Sanskrit. Was that Pali? No, that Google, Google, Google Pali. That wasn't Pali. Then I finally came across a language that existed between traders between India and China from 300 BC to like 800 BC or something like that, or 80. And, uh, and that's when I saw some of the fragments of this language that I'd seen in these metal plates. And it was really a mind blower to, to realize that some of these things you can literally confirm when you wake up if you really pay attention to what you're seeing. But again, I, I do think um, that this, if people would really pay attention to their dreams and lucid dreams, um, probably more people would become convinced that they've had other lives and other times as mm -hmm. other people and involved. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else have any thoughts about parallel universes and their dreams? I, I don't have like specific um, experiences that I've had, but I've had other friends that have had similar to what Robert just shared, where clearly it was from another lifetime. And through us talking and having certain real-time experiences, me with some of these people, we clearly were in another life together. And that's why we're connecting again. There's more, more for us to heal and work through in this lifetime. So I've, I've had confirmation on a number of different levels that people that are currently in my life, I had other lifetimes with. I just didn't consciously know it until I met them. And I was like, wow, okay. I mean, I've had, I mean, there's deja vus and things like that. I've had that a number of times in my life. So I definitely know um, just in my knowing again, that's just what I trust and what I go to always. My inner knowing knows there's other lifetimes, other dimensions. Um, and I continue to explore the ways that I, I can have more access to that. But I, I'm through lucid, lucid dreaming makes a lot of sense. That's one of the ways that we can certainly access that for ourselves, our own lives and, and with others that might be our ancestors as well. Mm. Mm, thank you. Yeah, those are all fascinating. I mean, that's, that's I, my mind is blown, by the way, by everything we just talked about. Uh, you know, the Heart Sutra and even the idea of looking through someone else's eyes. I guess, um, you know, the, the next question I, I would have about that would be, we talked a lot about what people in our dreams can represent 
you know, we talked a little bit about them possibly representing aspects of ourself, uh, characters we play. Um, we talked about looking through someone else's eyes, and I'm wondering a little bit more about that. Um, you know, if you had control, if you had awareness and ability to manipulate um, in the dream and in in the eyes of someone else, um, are these playable characters in some way? Are these people? Um, that may be sentient on their own, and are we interacting in another universe? And again, we've all we've already talked a little bit about this, but I'd love to hear more feelings about the other people that we meet in the dreams and and all of the ideas that that they, well, who they could be. So, so when I give workshops and all, I I, I try to get across the idea that um, all dream figures are not created equal; that that dream figures vary, and uh, and the way you can work with this in a lucid dream is you can go up and talk to dream figures. And if you read a thousand lucid dreams, um, you, you read about 40% of the time, the dream figure has nothing to say and just kind of won't meet your gaze. And just, you know, it's just kind of like one of those cast of characters, you know, that didn't have any uh, uh, parts in the play. I mean, you just, you just walked up and asked the wrong character. But in other cases, uh, Sometimes you'll find dream figures who are very conscious and very aware and will meet your eyes. And like, you'll say something like, hey, do you know that I'm dreaming this? And it'll reply, how do you know I'm not dreaming this? And then you'll say, well, look, I can fly. And it'll say, well, look, I can fly. And then, then you'll end up trying to figure out, you know, whose lucid dream is this? You know, because it can do everything that you can do. So you can find ones that seem to be equal to you in a sense. And then I've had cases where I've asked dream figures, oh, would you like to go flying? And when they grab your arm and take you flying and they're dragging you through space, then, then that's when you really think, wow, whose lucid dream is this? Because uh, you know, th they're flying me, I, I'm, I'm just going along for the ride. So, so you realize that dream figures vary and that's why it's important to be respectful and ask them questions and kind of see by their responses where they are on the continuum. But then you get into more interesting character situations like uh, deceased dream figures. So, so let's say tonight, uh, if I fell asleep and, and saw my dad, uh, you know, I might become lucid and I'd go, oh, wait a second, uh, dad's dead. Uh, this must be a dream. But then I would wonder, is this my dad as a dream figure, as maybe a symbol of my grief or unprocessed emotions? Or is this my dad as a spiritual being in the after death state. And I remember one time, it was about three years after he'd passed away, uh, I saw a ladder uh, coming down from above, here comes my dad. And the first thing I, I realized, oh, this is a dream because his dad's been dead for three years. And then I started to laugh because he had such a bad haircut. And I thought he can't even get a good haircut in the after death state. Because my dad was the guy who would go to the $5 barbers, you know, and he'd come back and he'd look like, oh my God. So anyway, so when he came down and we greeted each other, I, I decided I was going to figure this out. So I started asking questions. I, I said, hey, dad, you're from the land of the dead. When do you think mom's going to pass away? And he said, oh, probably two to six years. I said, of what? He said, a, a heart condition. And, and that really surprised me because my mom had never had any heart troubles. Then I asked him one more question and he replied, and then he told me to please be quiet because he had come to tell me things. And, and then, you know, the next five or 10 minutes, he was telling me things about the family. But as it turned out, uh, 23 months later, my mom went to the hospital and almost died of a heart condition. And then about three years after that, uh, she had been taking a prescribed medication that they actually learned was harming the heart. And she almost died again, but she made it through that two to six, six year period and continues to live today. But, but this is what I'm saying is a beautiful thing about lucid dreaming. You can use it to explore and experiment within your larger uh, framework. And a lot of lucid dreamers engage with deceased dream figures. Sometimes they're just grief and emotion, you know, they're representations of grief and, and those kind of emotions. And th those are normally the dream figures who they won't respond to questions, they, they just, they're just there. But the ones who are responsive, you know, sometimes they give warnings, sometimes they tell you what horse to play and at the horse track the next day. It, it's wild what happens. But I think it really shows that this issue of uh, deceased uh, is really something 
that could be explored much more seriously, especially if people would begin to see how you could use lucid dreaming in a scientific way to investigate this. Yes. Yeah, I, I appreciate that story, Robert. That was one of the stories that stood out in your book um, was, was that particular story. And, and it's fascinating to me how we can interact in that way. And, you know, and then what you were talking about earlier too, like whose dream is this? And so a couple different things are going on in my mind right now. First off, where's the consent level? You know, because this is a lot of the work that we do as professional cuddlers and, and intimacy work and all of that. Like, how do we work that in the dream world? How do we have consent and, and can we like agree to meet together and have an experience together? Um, that to me is part of what I would love to consciously do with somebody else and go, okay, let's meet, have this dream experience and see, see how, how that works. But yeah, how how would we do that? And I, and I've definitely had, um, dreams of, of the deceased, um, not in grand detail where I had interaction, but unexpected things. Like, um, when my grandmother passed, this was many years ago, um, she wasn't supposed to, she was in the hospital. She had something that was going on. I think her, her hip or something. Um, but it wasn't like terminal. And I went to work like I did. And um, well, actually the night before, that's when I had the dream where she came to me, you know, and she was clearly like, you know, leaving, leaving this, this plane of existence. I'm like, wait a minute, what's happening? Are you okay? And, you know, she clearly was not, she was not okay. Then. Like, why, where, where am I going? You know, and clearly was like, you know, I could not reach her. And it was very disconcerting to me. And the next morning is when I was at work and sure enough, I got a call and my mom told me that my grandmother had passed. And I'm like, what? And I'm like, oh my God, that was real. That was her communicating to me that I'm, I'm going, what's happening. And um, yeah, so that blew me away. And then same thing with my dad. My dad actually just recently passed in January. Um, the day before he passed, I started talking about it, like as if I knew it was coming. And then he must have came to me. I didn't have conscious memory of it, but um, he was trying to contact me because I had a friend over and she said, you gasped in your sleep. So I clearly had a visceral reaction um, during the time that we believe that he passed or shortly thereafter. So I've had snippets of these experiences, but um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm fascinated by it, but I, I just, how do we like more consciously do this and engage with, with each other and have this, again, this consent piece that I was talking about that we could do this together. What, one thing that I've uh, realized from lucid dreaming all these years is, is that one of the things that holds us back and holds back our abilities is uh, fear. And, uh, you know, so, sometimes we, we fear what we might know and, and we fear what might happen. And, and so like uh, before my dad passed away, I told myself repeatedly that in my dreams, I wanted to understand as he got closer to passing away. And so that I completely allowed information to come to me clearly and without any censoring or hesitation. And, you know, I just accepted, hey, dad's going to die. And, and that's how it is. And I'll tell you, I had just amazing dreams of how it was all going to unfold, how everything was going to happen and how it was all going to work. But normally, most of us, oh, you know, I don't want to think about my mom dying. I don't want to think about, you know, my brother dying. I don't want to think about it. And, and so we, we're already censoring it at a very uh, deep level. And a lot of us have our normal fears of death that are in there too. But if you let go of that, boy, you can get just super clear information. And, and that, that makes it uh, very powerful. Um, you know, so, so I can't say that I understand a lot about cuddling or being a cuddler. But I remember one time I was at a, a workshop and I asked the lucid dreamers there, how do you use lucid dreaming, um, you know, and get value out of it? 
And, and so there was a guy who was a psychotherapist and he said, oh, whenever I have a difficult client and I become lucidly aware, I ask to find out something about my difficult client. And he said, so often the information I get is just, it blows me away. And, and then in the next session, I'll, I'll kind of bring up the issue that was revealed to me. And then all of a sudden we have a breakthrough and, and it all uh, gets, gets uh, more quickly resolved. But he said one time uh, he saw one of his clients uh, walking down the beach and she had this black thing flying around her head and, and he became lucidly aware because it was just so strange. And, and so he thought, oh, there's this black thing around her. I, I'm going to go zap it and, and that'll free her of whatever her issue was. And as he flew up to her, the, the black energy above her head said, it's not for you to take care of this. It's for her to resolve this. And that's when he realized, oh, you know, he's being shown that there's this issue and it's up there, you know, in her headspace. And, and it's for her to figure out and not for him to just uh, zap and take out. So, so I think a lot of times, you know, uh, um, whatever the issue is with people, uh, sometimes uh, by asking in a dream, we can get a better understanding of it. And especially when we open up and allow that kind of thing to occur. Yeah, no, I, I love that because that is exactly what it is and, and why coaching related to me, even though I've been interested in, in all I'm different really things. Um, but it just really, we ultimately have to do our own work, no matter who is counseling or facilitating whatever process we're in. Ultimately, I got to do it. I got to crack open that cocoon. You know, the butterfly will die if, if you try to open it up for it. It has to do it itself. You know, the caterpillar has to go through that gooey, icky, process the darkness whatever we want to call it dark night of the soul we have to do it we have to do the work but yet we need that that framework we need our support systems that you know people that are, are there to kind of hold us through that process and ask those questions because we can ask questions we can suggest things but ultimately that person's got to come to their own conclusion love that that. Yeah, I'm, I'm really fascinated by everything that you guys have said. And, and again, I, I very much love the idea uh, that you've mentioned that we've we've come to several times of surrendering and how that really assists in, in healing, how that assists in, in guiding us through and being able to see more and lucid dream more. I, I'm uh, impressed and amazed even just thinking about um, what a great connection and what a what a a grounding connection this feels to the spiritual realm or to the higher self. You know, it, it seems from everything you said, Robert, that that I'm what I'm getting from it is such a, a beautiful mental and spiritual health healing, such a beautiful transition into again, um, you know, what some would call a higher self or a, a deeper self. And we do hide from that, but it, it exists. It's there. And so everything you've said has uh, really wowed me today so far. I just want to say that. <laughs> Thank you. And of course, everybody's shares have been amazing. But, but one thing I do want to say about lucid dreaming, though, is, is lucid dreaming is an open platform. You can use it if you want to, uh, to explore spiritual things. You can meditate in the lucid dreams. You can do all sorts of spiritual practices in a lucid dream. But you can also, uh, you know, if you're a 19-year-old kid, uh, you use all of your lucid dreams to have as much uh, intimacy fun as you want to and just go after it, you know, into the hundreds and 300s and 400s and just get in this repetitive thing until finally uh, you wake up and become tired of it or, or realize you've exhausted that, uh, that area. So, so you can use lucid dreaming to access creativity, to heal emotionally. People use it uh, sometimes uh, to promote physical healing, they use it to engage this larger awareness, and, and also they can use it for spiritual whatever. But it is an open platform. If you think that dreaming is just meaningless and stupid, then most of your lucid dreams are just flying around having fun and doing dorky stuff, and that's, that's where it goes. But it, it's an open platform, so you can do with it what you want. Uh, but if you're smart, uh, hopefully you'll, you'll read a good book and uh, get some ideas on how you can use it in a thoughtful manner. 
I, yeah. I, yeah. Go ahead, I just want to comment one more situation. Cause like you said, you can use it in so many different ways. And I don't even know if I knew about lucid dreaming at the time I did this, but back in my computer days, I, you know, there were things I could not resolve sometimes, you know, I do my work and I'm like, oh, just can't figure out what, what's going on with this particular coding issue. I would go home and put it into my subconscious and it would do its thing. I don't even remember exactly how the dream went, but I would wake up and I'm like, got it. I know exactly what I need to do. And so literally sleep on it really is, is a legit thing. It's, and we can use our, our brain that, that surrender space to resolve all sorts of things. And I, I just love that. And I, when I remember to use that more often, it works brilliantly. <laughs> yeah. No. This has been very rich. I do want to say, first off, how, how rich this feels, how fantastically inspired I am to uh, work on mantras, changing my language and surrendering into a lucid dream. I think that's amazing. I do want to ask a quick question um, and, and feel free to share as much or as little about this like I would love to hear a scary inspiring the dream that sticks out in your mind you know if you have an infamous or a famous dream or nightmare and I, I personally have two that I can think of um and I will I will let you guys share first I'm very excited to share my my famous or infamous dreams but I'd love to start with Bethany I'd love to hear any unique experience you've had while sleeping that might be deemed intense <laughs> And you may be muted still, just in case. <laughs> muted, yes, of course. Um, yeah, I've had so many dreams that have been really powerful in a lot of ways. A lot of the things that you've talked about um, and like the dreams of um, working things out and then facing them and then those traumas d disappearing, that has happened a number of times. Um, but the one dream that... Um, I'm thinking of now was actually a young lady who just passed away who um, came and visited me and just needed a message passed over. Um, and she came many times until I had to tell her, I will tell her your message, but you can't wake me up anymore. <laughs> um, but um, now that I'm learning more about lucid dreaming, I'm really excited to be able to learn that tool and take it back into dreaming and go back to those situations and get so much more out of them. Um, and you know, some, some of the people who passed over seemed to come to me pretty confused and sad. So I'm looking forward to being able to interact more and help people in that way. Um, and also myself, so um, yeah. Um, I, I'm not the best share. I'm more excited to listen to you guys, but, um, but yeah, thanks. That was an amazing share. Oh, that was oh, I, I just remembered one more thing. Maybe I could ask um, Robert about, um, I'd watched a podcast the other day um, and you were talking about spirit tones. Did I get that right? Personal uh, tones? Feeling tones. Feeling tones. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? I'm really interested in that. Yeah. Um, well, well, first, I was going to share a story uh, uh, about a deceased uh, situation. So, one time I was away on a business trip, and the spouse of my wife's boss passed away. And, and so I, I knew them by virtue of going to holiday parties and stuff like that. But that night, uh, I'm going down the stairway and coming up the stairway is Harry and Dahlia. And, and Dahlia had just passed away. And I, I walked up to them and now I became lucidly aware. And I, I looked at them and I said, Dahlia, I'm so sorry that you've passed over and I'm on this business trip and won't be able to come to your funeral. And as soon as I said the words passed over, they both got big wide eyes. They looked at each other and they ran down the stairs. <laughs> and I don't, what I'm thinking is that she was in that intermediate state where she still hadn't quite figured out that she had made the transition 
and she was just kind of in that state where you assume that things are strange, but somehow you you're carrying on. So so, so anyway, it's it's interesting sometimes uh, when you have those kind of situations uh, when you meet somebody, but uh, but but you'll have to remind me of what your question was, uh, Bethany, uh, and, and then I'll get to that. Sorry, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, your feeling tone. Yeah. Your so, personal feeling tone. So, uh, so I taught myself how to lucid dream in 1975. Uh, the uh, scientific evidence came out in 1980, 81. And then in 1985, I was part of a three-year lucid dreamers explorers group that every month would have a goal to achieve. And, and I think it was uh, uh, March or May of 85. Uh, it was to find out what the dream figures in your lucid dream represent. And so, so I thought that'd be easy. Uh, I became lucidly aware, followed a woman into an office and, and now there were three women in the office and a guy in a three piece suit. And, and so I just walked up to the guy and said, excuse me, what do you represent? And instead of the guy responding, uh, a voice from above him kind of boomed out a partial response. And so I said, blah, 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 what? And then it boomed out the full response of what the gentleman represented, the dream figure represented. But in the morning, I thought, well, wait a second. Uh, why didn't the dream figure respond? Why did this non-visible voice respond? And so that's when I began to interact with this awareness behind the dream, this non-visible awareness. And so as I began to explore, I began to wonder, how much does the non-visible awareness know? And so I'd been reading a book by uh, Jane Roberts uh, called Seth Speaks. And I think in this book, she brings up the idea of feeling tones, that everybody has a feeling tone that's the essence of themselves in this life. And so, so there's just like two paragraphs on it. And so after I read it, I thought, well, wait a second, is it more feeling or more tone? What is this? What, what is a feeling tone? And so I became lucidly aware one night and I ignored all the dream figures, ignored the dream setting. And I just shouted out, shouted out, hey, dream, I want to hear my feeling tone. And suddenly high above me, this little black dot appears. And from it comes this very high pitched ah sound, this ah. And as I watch, this little dot creates a cone of vibrating ah, and it keeps getting bigger and bigger. And literally, the awe becomes so tremendous, it vibrates me out of existence. And if you can imagine, then it's kind of like uh, my awareness has kind of ceased in a way, but I, I can now see this vibrating cone of awe. And I think right then, uh, more or less, I'm in the larger awarenesses framework. And after a while, it thought, Oh, I need to uh, recapitulate that one. I need to bring him back. Now, which one was he? And it's like it has to go through this roller decks of, of selves until finally it comes across Robert Wagoner. And then as soon as it did, I found myself in a lucidly aware, sitting in a full lotus position, looking at the house that I was sleeping in. Uh, my fingers were in a mudra. I didn't even know what a mudra was at that time. They were glowing, glowing gold from within. And I thought, what just happened to me? And I thought, what was that awesome sound? And I go, whoa, not going back there. But it was only years later, I realized that ah is the uh, Buddhist dream yoga sound connected to lucid dreaming is ah. And, and also it has all this connection with, with that uh, state of awareness. And then I realized that, you know, in, in the Vedas or the, the Hindi view of the world, uh, everything is kind of sounded into being. We, we come by virtue of kind of mantra sounds that are pulsing the phenomenal world into being. And, and this little black dot that they call a seed syllable, I think it's called a bila. And, and from that emerges the sound. And I, I'll tell you, it's wild to experience a concept in lucid dreams. And, and that's why this is how profound lucid dreaming is. But when you read the, you know, these ancient, you know, Vedas and, and, and you think, how did they come up with this stuff that, oh, there's all this and that. But in a lucid dream, when you're shown a whole schema 
and, and then you go, oh, well, that, that's how they did it. They, they got, they accessed the information probably in some sort of lucid dreamlike state. But anyway, so, so that's, that's what a feeling tone is all about, but it gets to the larger issue of experiencing concepts. And that's why I encourage people who are on a spiritual path, uh, if you become lucidly aware, don't try to find God or Buddha or, or Allah or whatever. You, you'll get too excited and you'll wake up. Uh, th that's just what's gonna happen. But if you wanna have a really great experience, ask to experience the quality of the divine. J just announce something like, hey dream, let me experience unconditional love. Or hey dream, let me feel one moment of atonement. Or hey dream, let me feel whatever it is, a minute of samadhi. Sometimes the experience is so powerful. Yeah, I mean, you'll have your socks blown off. You'll, you'll just be amazed how much energy you can feel. But, but again, um, that's a wonderful question. Thanks for bringing that up. Thank Thanks, you so much. That was amazing. Thank you so much for answering that. I, I feel like my mind has been repeatedly blown maybe every question so far. Um, Susan, I was gonna say, we, we didn't go into some magical dreams for you. <laughs> oh, I'd love to hear your unique dream. Um, I don't know how my internet's going to be. It, it, I obviously dropped off for a little bit. So um, just let me know if it's not coming through clear, but I, I think I'm good now. Um, gosh, I don't know. I'm trying to think in, in this moment now. I mean, I've had, I, I mean, I've flown. I really enjoyed my flying dreams. Those to me were really memorable. And I, I love that experience. Um, gosh, I'm just trying to think of what else I'd want to share. Um, hmm. you know, just, just tried, like, I remember I wanted to know like how, how I see color or if I see color in dreams. So just again, like, like Robert's talking about just asking questions about anything. What am I curious about? And at one point in time, I was curious about color because I love vibrant color and people would say, oh, it's in black and white. I'm like, I don't think so. I'm trying it. So I did before I went to sleep one night, I'm like, sure enough. And I was like with all these different people and I was noticing what they were wearing. Oh, that's blue shorts over there. Oh, that thing's purple. Oh, look at that over there. And I just, I was just fascinated, you know? So I, I just, anytime I can have some sort of experience, whether I'm viscerally feeling it or something visually or whatever, where I just um, plant that seed and look for it and play with it. So now I'm excited to try like sounds or feelings because I hadn't really played with that. So I'm, I'm excited to explore that, Robert, because I didn't really, I don't know, I guess I just didn't think about it. Surprised I didn't because I'm such a curious person. So I'm going to play with that now. Like, what's unconditional love or what's, I mean, that just, that'll be interesting. We'll see, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know <laughs> how that goes. <laughs> Thank you. That's amazing, Susan. Again, that, that, I'm very, very fascinated and impressed with, with everybody's shares and all of the comments today. Um, it's interesting because as, as I was asking the question of, of tell me about your most unique dream, uh, or your most impressive or intense or, you know, nightmare, anything that really stands out to you. You know, I thought about it and I do have one kind of infamous dream in my head where I was an ant and there was a, an elephant and it was in cartoon world. Um, and, and it's a dream that I don't know if it was repetitive, but I had it as a child and I felt so aware of, of things in it. Um, but I've actually only had one dream where I became aware that I was dreaming and, and can remember it. It was a nightmare. And I said to myself, wow, I really want to wake up now. And there was again, cartoon figures that I think that may have been what tipped me off. Something was off about the coloring. Uh, and again, I've always dreamt in color. So it is kind of interesting that some people, I guess, don't believe they do or don't see that. Um, and so I guess my, my, one of my closing questions or one of the closing questions, and this is something I've wanted to ask the entire episode, <laughs> the entire time, by the way, is if I were somebody who doesn't recognize how to, to really become aware, I've, I've already read some tips. Uh, but I would love to hear from, from you guys, what would you recommend to somebody who wants to learn how to lucid dream or practice? Um, I'm well already sold on your book, sir. I'm very excited about this actually. But I would love to hear even just simple tips I could do tonight, simple tips I could walk away with from 
all four of you, all three, I don't know how many were here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and of course, any information on how we can reach you. Yeah. Well, if, when it comes, to, there are some relatively simple ways of becoming lucidly aware. And uh, first, a person wants to get into the habit of good dream recall, because if you're not recalling your dreams, uh, you might become lucidly aware and not even recall it. So you, you want to get into good dream recall. And, and then... Um, I'll tell you what I did um, um, back when I was a kid. Uh, um, I got into the habit of doing this. Uh, each night before I'd go to sleep, I'd look at the palm of my hands while telling myself, tonight in my dreams, I'll see my hands and realize I'm dreaming. Tonight in my dreams, I'll see my hands and realize I'm dreaming. And I'd just repeat that over and over to make that my intent before I went to sleep. And then each time I woke up, I'd try to remember what I dreamt and did I see my hands? So I would do that for about five minutes and fall asleep. On the third night of doing it, um, I'm walking through my high school hallway. I was in high school at the time. And all of a sudden, just like they're spring loaded, boom, my hands popped right in front of my face. And I said, my hands, this is a dream. And it was so wild to realize that these football player guys over there, they're, they're really dream figures. And I touched a nearby wall just to see what it would feel like. And it felt exactly cool and nubby, just like you'd expect. And I went on to have just an amazing lucid dream. So, so that's how I got started with it, just in this kind of stimulus response. Every time I see my hands, my thought would be, this is a dream. Um, probably the, the other thing would just be the power of suggestion. Like tonight, my dreams, I'm gonna be much more aware. And when I notice something strange, I'll realize I'm dreaming. And I would just repeat that over to myself. And then in the dream state, I'd notice something strange and I think, boy, how am, how am I in London? I, I don't remember flying here. And oh, this is a dream. So, so those are some easy ways. But, but there's a lot to lucid dreaming. Uh, just becoming lucidly aware, there's still a lot to know after that. But, but that could get you through the front door, at least, and give you an experience. Thank you so much. That, that's awesome. And I'm, I'm very grateful for those shares. And they, they really, I, I will be practicing. I, I really resonate with the idea that language matters and that what we tell ourselves, how we address ourselves internally affects the outside world. And of course, uh, Bethany, any, any idea, any shares on, on how to create lucid dreams, anything in your heart space or anything you'd like to share? In my dreams, I'm probably muted. In, um, <laughs> Well, I, I have had a few lucid dreams, but not, um, not on purpose. And um, so I, I think that um, actually meditation is one of the gateways into this. And, and I think that's um, a good place to start. I know when I was small, I used to meditate a lot. And um, that's when I had the lucid dreams at that point. Um, so that would be my inexpert <laughs> suggestion for how to share your lucid dreams. Um, that's amazing. No, oh, that's very, very makes sense. I've got like a 5,000 more questions for Robert, but I don't think we have time. <laughs> Me too. I totally understand. I totally feel you. Thank you for saying that. I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we need to have like a four hour podcast or something <laughs> but but I, I really appreciate um being able to hear all of what all of you have shared and and I'm so excited to get back into practicing lucid dreaming and my adventure is just starting <laughs> I love it that's perfect that's very beautiful and thank you for sharing what we were all feeling I, I love it and Susan would you like to share any any advice or any tidbits on how you lucid dream um, well, I think I've kind of alluded to it and we've, we've touched upon it here. It's basically that intention, you know, so having some sort of routine. Um, so when I'm practicing it, it, it comes really simply to me. Like I said, I just planted that in my mind, literally just one night said, hey, I want to see if I dream in color or, oh, I want to solve this program problem or whatever, you know, just anything, but it's part of it. I think also Bethany spoke to too, it's having that quieting of the mind. It's the space you're creating before you go to sleep. If I'm 
distracted by something else, it, it might not help me lead into that experience. So like Robert saying, he was very intentional. Okay, I'm gonna see my hands. You know, so something having that talisman, that something that's gonna help you. Oh yeah, okay, this is how I'm gonna know. Am I lucid dreaming or not? And then again, just having that intention. What, what do I, what am I curious about? I mean, to me, that works in waking life as well. Anything that we put our energy and focus on, guess what? You're going to get some of that, the whole law of attraction. So I, I feel like it works for lucid dreaming as well. So let's, let's make use of it in all the different realms that we can <laughs> connect and explore. And, and um, yeah. That's beautiful. That's really powerful. And I, I really do love the idea of intention, ritual, rep repetition. Uh, I love the idea of vulnerability, surrender, meditation. Um, you know, even just those, those little tidbits actually are, are really inspiring. So I do want to say thank you once again for everybody who spent some time today talking with us. Um, I do want to make sure I give a little space that if you would like to share an email, a website, a way to reach you if anybody has questions for any of you. Does anybody want to share how to reach them? So um, you're always welcome to check out my websites. Um, I, I have two. Uh, uh, one is dreaminglucid.com and the other is lucid-dreaming-advice.com. Amazing. And there you can find out what I'm up to or I have uh, places to ask questions and that sort of thing. So. Uh, so thanks. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, we're really grateful to have you. It was a real pleasure, Robert. And I, I will be certainly checking those websites out. We'll also put them in uh, the comments so that we so that our viewers can take a look and click on the links. Anyone else like to share their website or info? Um, I'm going to pop, pop in and say too, but I just wanted to share I have your book. <laughs> so if anyone wants to check out at least this book is is this was the first one, I think, right, Robert? So that's right. That's right. The, the second book is Lucid Dreaming, Plain and Simple. And that, that's more all the tips and techniques. But, but thank you, Susan. That's that's sweet of you. Yeah. Well, I again, I, I I'm fascinated by it. And kind of like I think Bethany already stated this, I'm I'm going to more consciously do my practice again because I kind of got out of the practice and, and it really worked for me. You know, we have all these wonderful tools, but sometimes we forget to use them, you know, we get excited or distracted or off into something else. And so I'm, I'm appreciating this discussion as reignited that, that tool set for me and, um, and how to reach me. Um, I'm Susan Lee. So you can find me on Facebook. I know there's a million Susan Lees, but maybe if you search um, for particular things related to soul coaching, professional cuddling, of that nature, Cuddle Sanctuary is where I receive my training from. So um, that could help you in searching for that. Um, you can find me at cuddlesanctuary.com under their services. I'm one of, one of the professionals under there. And then also too, you can find me on Instagram at susanlee812 and uh, Gmail, susanlee812 at gmail.com. And I'm working on my new website, uh, Dimensions of Relating. So that's not ready yet, but it's coming. So look forward to having you check that out. Thank you so much for sharing, Susan. And I would like to say uh, that I was really, really blessed to meet the beautiful Susan Lee at training for Cuddle Sanctuary. We worked, worked together. I have also um, utilized her soul coaching hours and times we've, we've connected really beautifully virtually. Uh, she is somebody I would highly recommend as a soul coach. If you are looking for something that's maybe a little off the beaten path of a typical life coach. Um, I, I was very, very inspired and grateful for the time that her and I have spent uh, working together. So I would like to, to say that as well. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Crystal. And thank you for having me here. We're so grateful. I would like to be mindful of everyone's time. I'm going to go into our cuddle poses uh, of the week. I'm going to talk a little bit about promotions. If anybody needs to, to take off uh, for their benefit, please let me know. It now, now could be a good time to divert. You're also welcome to stay, whatever you prefer. I'm going to call it a night, uh, if that's all right. Uh, all right. But th thanks, everyone. And uh, it's a lot of fun to uh, chat with you. It meant the world to us. I'm really grateful. Thank you, all of you, for being here. Great to meet you, Robert.
Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you. Okay. Adios. Are we all dropping off here? <laughs> well, I will. I, I, I don't stay on to talk for a minute, <laughs> but just for a moment. And I'm very grateful. There's no pressure. You're welcome to stay. You're welcome to take off. Yeah. Um, I, I thought this was more housekeeping after the. It's up to you. Yeah, I'm visiting family is the only reason why I, I'm wanting to drop off. Otherwise, I, I would love to stay longer. This is, this could have gone on, like you said, Bethany, for hours. This is a fascinating subject. Really appreciate being a part of it and look forward to more, more of this. So I was really inspired. You guys are amazing. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Yeah. I think it would be great to have a, like a whole, like when you're, something like you're exchanging the dreams that you've had. I don't know what that format would be like, but I mean, I'm just thinking about a dozen other dreams, like, oh, I wish I could tell them about this one or this one or this one. I think it's fascinating to hear dreams. I feel you. And I actually was very, very inspired by the idea. Hi, season. I was very inspired by the idea of connecting um, and doing peer-to-peer -peer dream sharing or even trying to attempt to be connected over long distances and, and dream together, if that makes sense. Meaning, what would it take? Would we do mantras together? Would we eye gaze? Would we do intimacy work? Would we be laying next to each other? Lots of good stuff. I, well, we're I, even I, meeting and talking about them. Go ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, 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 I'm like a chronic interrupter, I'm sorry. Oh, you're golden. No, I've had like um, people come to me in dreams. Like they, they intended to, they came and then they asked me about it afterward. Yeah. And I think like practicing the lucid dreaming and you can, you can visit other people in those lucid dreams. So I think that would be, well, a, you, you know, have my consent to visit you in a dream if it's possible. Oh, sure. Come on I, over. <laughs> I, I will do my best um, to meditate specifically and we're in the same city. So maybe that'll benefit. I don't know. I'm very, very excited. And of course, I, I am just so intensely grateful. And I, I, I didn't get a chance to say that I am, and you already know this. I am grateful to say I'm having my first group cuddle event in a long time. We're going to do this as safely and as mindfully as we can. It's going to be soon. And I'm hoping to start doing that regularly again. Yeah, you, you'd mentioned that you were going to do that. And it's right up the street. So I'll definitely come. <laughs> Wonderful. And again, I, I didn't get a chance to say that, you know, my name is Crystal. I do live in the Pittsburgh area. I'm stating this for the podcast. Um, you can reach me at crystaltherapy.cc at gmail.com. I can also be reached via Facebook um, with Crystal's Cuddle Therapy. I can also be reached via Instagram uh, at Cuddle Pittsburgh. Uh, I am a grateful member of Nurtured Nerds and can also be reached at Nurtured Nerd Newbies at gmail.com. I think I said that right. Um, and so, and again, Bethany, we will be mindful of your time. We're going to go over the cuddle position of the week. And I created it myself. And I'm very proud of this, by the way, guys. And so the cuddle position of the week is called lucid dream team. Now this can be done solo, or this can be done and, and you can lucidly dream to meet your partner, or this can be done in person. And I hope my connection is still working well. Um, so if you're laying next to your partner, again, this could be a friend, this could be a lover, this could be just your cuddle buddy, um, and you're holding hands and you sleep, literally just fall asleep, you are now the lucid dream team cuddle pose. And I'm so excited. I just created that <laughs> while we were talking. Oh, that's so sweet. I love it. I love holding hands. And we can we can do that otter style, even when you're, you're not in the same space as me, and we will hopefully connect over dreams. Bethany, you and I, we're going to try and do this. <laughs> I'm very excited. I, yeah, I, I'm excited too. The other person I connected with in a dream was in Norway. So I'm not sure if the distance is a problem, but. <laughs> uh, I don't think it is. I really don't. And I think it's it's a magical, everything that we talked about today was mind blowing, awe inspiring, and really just resonated and connected in with so many of my spiritual practices. And, and once again, I try not to give away too many of my cards or show too much of my hand, but I very much have been, you know, a student of spirituality for a long time and esoteric religion um, and, and just culture and, and anthropology. Um, and so I'm, I'm just so amazed and, and impressed with everything we've talked about tonight. And it's really touched into some places that, that make me wanna keep learning and keep growing. I do wanna mention before we, before we end some of the Nurtured Nerds information, if you ever wanna find us, and of course, my computer's being silly right now. So <laughs> um, I do want to make sure you're aware that 
We are available at nurturednerds.com. We're also on Facebook at uh, facebook.com forward slash nurturednerds, Instagram, Discord server, and Twitch stream coming soon. We do have a new member raffle for Nurtured Nerds. Uh, we are starting a dance break and we do have nerd breaks. And so really wonderful ways to connect virtually. And I'm very inspired by what we've talked about today to kind of do a nerd break on dreams. Um, but we do have nerd breaks once a week. We're trying to start up a dance break, either once daily, once weekly, once monthly, possibly a mix. Um, we are having a new member raffle, as I mentioned, uh, that does include a free 30 minute virtual session with any participating professional cuddler. Uh, and of course that's after an intake screening and consent from that cuddler. I am one of the cuddlers on that list. There is a free ebook on cuddling and connection. Um, and I believe that is written by the beautiful Mary, um, a free video game gift card, which can be used to download a video or PC game. And of course, you get a chance to uh, submit a question for some of our wonderful Nurtured Nerds epic podcasts, which I really do think are part of the heart and soul of Nurtured Nerds. We try to touch on things that people, um, we try to touch on things that people are fascinated by, connected in with aficionados of, or just something you can be quote unquote nerdy about. And, and I once again, would really, really like to take a moment to thank everybody who is here today. Of course, Miss Bethany, um, Miss Susan Lee, um, the wonderful Roberts, um, and of course, our Gita, our ghost in the machine, uh, the, the wonderful gentleman who is behind the scenes and helping us do all of this work. Um, so yeah, I want to say thank you to everybody who's been a part of this. I do want to ask if you are feeling nurtured. And of course, Bethany, you're the only one here. How are you feeling? <laughs> very nurtured and very, I just keep using the word excited because I am super excited to dive into those dreams and make them work for me. <laughs> I feel that energy and I'm very, very grateful. So what we're gonna do now, just to let everyone know is we're gonna say goodbye, we're gonna say goodnight. Um, we are not gonna hang, hang up though. So Bethany, of course, you're welcome to stick around for a minute as even now, or you're welcome to take, your, take care of yourself. I wanna make sure you're nurtured and loved. I'm gonna ask, would you like to have a hug? I would love a hug. <laughs> Thank you. And hugs out to everybody in Nurtured Nerds land. I love you. <laughs> So I have no idea if we're still recording or if we still want to keep moving forward. Is there anything else I need to say? <laughs> oh, I probably should say you can you can reach me if you so desire uh, at Bethany Altieri on Facebook. <laughs> Perfect. And that is wonderful. I would love to connect with you further. And I'm so grateful to have your information. And I'm so grateful that you shared that. That is imperative. We all want to connect in. And if you're in the Nurtured Nerds world and you want to connect with Bethany, she is an amazing individual that I'm so grateful to know and to have met here in Pittsburgh in person. Oh, thank you. It means the world to me that you're part of our group. I'm happy to be here. And you can subscribe and comment on YouTube. Oh, God. <laughs> you can subscribe and comment on YouTube, Nurtured Nerds. And come back next time. <laughs> so, bye. Uh, <yeah>. uh, <laughs> uh. <laughs>